Chapter 19 is once again moving towards disunion within the United States, uh, some more of the growing rift between the North and the South that eventually led to the Civil War. So we're looking at 1854 to 1861. Now, before we start looking at the political stresses that were going on in the United States between the North and the South, it's important to look at two uh, pieces of literature that were published in the 1850s that helped prompt this anger between the North and the South. And the first one is Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, Harriet Beecher Stowe, her father was a minister during... Uh, the Great Awakening, Lyman Beecher. Her, her brother was a radical abolitionist, um, and she herself was obviously an abolitionist as well. Angered by the fugitive slave law, she wrote a novel called Uncle Tom's Cabin in which she hoped to depict the evils of slavery and how it split families apart. And in some cases, uh, the slaves were beaten to death. Now, uh, her main character, Uncle Tom, is almost this Jesus-like figure in her book, uh, and it was eventually murdered by uh, the evil uh, white overseer, Simon Legree. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe never actually met any slaves. She was from the North. Uh, but her book gained international popularity, and it really brought a human face to the issue of slavery. You know, it's one thing to say four million people are enslaved. It's another to uh, give them a face and an emotion and a personality uh, and to see what that institution actually looks like. Um, Beyond just being popular in the United States, it's all, it also gained international popularity, specifically in Great Britain and France. And many people would argue uh, that it's because of this popularity uh, that helped to lead, or I should say a lack of uh, help from Great Britain during the Civil War for the South. Many Southerners believed that should war come between the U.S. and the CSA, the Confederate States of America, then Great Britain would step in to help the South so that they could continue trading with them with cotton. How However, however uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin um, linked the South now to this evil institution of slavery. Slavery had already been outlawed in Great Britain, and there was a large abolitionist sentiment there as well. In 1857, a white Southerner from uh, North Carolina, Hinton R. Helper, published The Impending Crisis of the South. Um, this book was once again against slavery, but for different reasons. He was against slavery because of the effect that it had on the non-slave-owning whites down south, those poor white people down south that could not afford to own uh, any slaves. Um, his book was burned and uh, banned in many parts of the South, and this only, both of these books only increased the anger between the North and the South as well. Here is Harriet Beecher Stowe, and beyond just selling copies of her books, she also gained popularity because her book was then translated into what are called Tom shows. So even if people didn't read the book, they probably saw a play depicting the same image. Now, out in the Western territories, remember, both the Democrats and the Whigs have to some degree left it up to the territories to decide this idea of popular sovereignty. The Kansas-Nebraska Act, as determined by um, the uh, little giant Stephen Douglas, um, said that Nebraska and Kansas would now uh, decide whether or not to have slavery based on popular sovereignty. So this was really a call to action for both sides, for the abolitionist side and for the pro-slavery side, to ship as many of their advocates out to those two territories as they could so that they could be there to vote either yes for slavery or no for slavery. Henry Ward Beecher, brother to Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, and the New England Emigrant Aid Society organized massive amounts of migrants to move out west uh, in order to vote for free soil out in Kansas. Now, this movement really, once again, angered the South uh, because they felt that they had had an unspoken agreement with the Kansas-Nebraska Act that even though we say there'll be popular sovereignty in both of these regions, Kansas was obviously supposed to go for slavery. And now they felt betrayed by having passed this Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, now that free soilers were moving out there and attempting to make Kansas a free soil territory.
And during the 1855 uh, election for the territory, what the territorial legislature, we see thousands of what are known as border ruffians. These are pro-slavery advocates flooding over the border of Kansas uh, from the neighboring slave state of Missouri to vote yes for slavery. Now these are not Kansas residents. Uh, these are Missourians uh, coming over the border to vote yes. This is obviously fraud uh, when it comes to uh, this election. Um, and so obviously this pro-slavery territorial government won and they set up their territorial legislature at Shawnee Mission in uh, uh, Kansas. The Free Soilers, angry over this fraud in this election, set up their own competing territorial legislature at Topeka, Kansas. And the question becomes, who is actually in charge? Which of these two legislatures uh, has the authority over the people there? Uh, here you see um, where that territory of Kansas uh, was in relation to where modern day Kansas is too. Now, adding fuel to the fire in 1856, uh, the free soil town of Lawrence, Kansas was burned probably obviously by uh, uh, pro-slavery advocates. This sparked an event in Kansas that is going to be called Bleeding Kansas. In retaliation for this burning of Lawrence, Kansas, the abolitionist John Brown from Hudson, Ohio, um, led a group of his followers from Osawatomie to Potawatomi Creek uh, in May of 1856 killing five people who he deemed to be pro-slavery. This was supposed to be in reaction to the burning of Lawrence. Uh, the reality was these people were probably not pro-slavery advocates, but what this does is jumpstart bleeding Kansas. This is literally, on a microcosm level, the Civil War going on in Kansas five years before the Civil War broke out nationwide. This is what's awaiting people because there is so much heated uh, feeling going on in Kansas at this time. Property was destroyed, agriculture was destroyed, people died during the battles that occurred during bleeding Kansas. Now right in the middle of all of this, um, Kansas had gained enough people and population in order to apply for statehood. So in 1857, um, they put forth a proposed state constitution that became known as the Lecompton Constitution. Now, the Lecompton Constitution was the proposed constitution from the pro-slavery government um, at Shawnee Mission. Now, this is a sneaky uh, sta proposed state constitution because it asked people to vote yes for the entire document or no for the entire document. But even if people voted no on the Lecompton Constitution, which they said, no, we don't want slavery in Kansas, it would still have safeguards put in place uh, for people living in Kansas at this time that had slaves or wanted to continue to import slaves. So even if people voted down the Lecompton Constitution as their proposed state constitution, slavery would still be allowed in Kansas. This is a sneaky, sneaky trick on the part of the pro-slavery advocates. And so the Free Soilers, seeing that this is a trick on their part, avoided the polls altogether. And so overwhelmingly, uh, the people going to the, vol the polls were obviously pro-slavery, and so they voted for the Lecompton Constitution uh, that would allow complete and total slavery in the state of Kansas. Now, uh, the senator, once again, uh, Stephen Douglas, even though this has nothing to do with him, but he had been the one that really had jump-started this idea of popular sovereignty out in uh, the Kansas and Nebraska territory. Uh, he said, this is not real uh, popular sovereignty. This is not what I had in mind when I had promoted this Kansas-Nebraska Act. However, the president at the time, who had southern leanings, James Buchanan, accepted the Constitution and uh, allowed Kansas to enter the Union. This creates an instant division within the Democratic Party because both James Buchanan and uh, Stephen Douglas are from the Democratic Party. This opens the door to allow a new party to form and come in, the Republican Party. Here is John Brown. Here's John Brown again. And here's crazy John Brown. <laughs> now, things are getting really heated in the mid-1800s or mid-1850s. Um, specifically, a senator from the North, um, Charles Sumner, 
watching what was unfolding down in Kansas, gave a scathing speech in which he titled it The Crimes Against Kansas. Uh, the Crimes Against Kansas not only talked about how terrible the situation was going on out in Kansas with Bleeding Kansas, but also during the course of his speech on the floor of the Senate, he insulted a senator from South Carolina, Andrew Butler. Now, in retaliation to this scathing insult, uh, Congressman Preston Brooks. Now, Preston Brooks had nothing to do with this other than the fact that he was also from South Carolina. He took an, he was insulted by this speech. He felt that it was an affront to all South Carolinians that Charles Sumner had called out his colleague, um, Andrew Butler. And so on May 22nd, 1856, uh, uh, Preston Brooks marched into Congress and beat the ever-loving crap out of Charles Sumner with a cane. Beat him till he was unconscious. Um, and beat him until his cane broke, in fact. Now, this is a terrible thing. Obviously, we laugh about it now, but this is a terrible thing. I can't imagine, you know, senators and congressmen beating each other up on the floor of the Senate. But the House of Representatives couldn't get enough votes within the House in order to expel Preston Brooks from the House. Instead, he resigned to go back home to South Carolina to be promptly reelected by uh, his constituents back in South Carolina. They obviously approved of what he had done. Uh, but the negative side consequence that, you know, obviously Preston Brooks had never envisioned was that this uh, increased interest into the whole speech that had started this debacle. And so Charles Sumner, even though he was off uh, for a while having to recuperate over in Europe, uh, Sumner's speech, which nobody would have known about otherwise, sold in the tens of thousands because people wanted to read what had jump-started this vicious attack. Uh, here is a depiction of Brooks attacking Sumner. Uh, here is the electoral map for 1856 when James Buchanan won. Now let's take a look at the Dred Scott decision. Now in 1857, uh, a slave by the name of Dred Scott uh, sued his master for his freedom. This case was taken all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, the basis of his lawsuit was the fact that he was a slave that had been brought by his master to the free soil states of Illinois and Wisconsin, and that he had lived there with his master for five years. Now, he said, based on my residency, I should be given my freedom because I'm living in a free soil state. The Supreme Court was ruled by uh, the South uh, predominantly at this time, specifically Chief Justice Roger Tawney. He was from Maryland. His goal was to undermine the free soil cause. He had been watching what was unfolding out in Kansas with this whole idea of popular sovereignty, um, and he really wanted to undermine this free soil uh, cause. And so in his opinion of the court, Justice Tawney basically said that First and foremost, Dred Scott had no standing in the Supreme Court. He was not a citizen, therefore he had no right to sue. But he wanted to go a step further beyond that. He also said in his opinion of the court that slaves are private property. Private property is specifically protected by the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So what this means, according to Justice Tawney in the Dred Scott decision, is that it doesn't matter whether a state is free soil or slave. Slaves can be taken anywhere in the United States because the U.S. government protects private property. You know, similarly, you couldn't deny a person from taking their chair with them when they moved to the North. So according to Justice Tawney, this was the same principle. And so based on this, he said that the Missouri Compromise of 1820 was unconstitutional, that even popular sovereignty can't uh, stop them. Because no matter what, if a slave owner wants to take his personal property to a territory, he can do that. This split the Democrats right down the center, um, and it is going to cause major controversies uh, uh, coming up here soon. This is like a bomb being thrown on this issue. Here is Dred Scott. Now, in 1858, in the U.S. Senate, there was a, an election to be held to who was going to become the next 
uh, senator from the state of Illinois, the incumbent Stephen Douglas. Now, Stephen Douglas had been a longtime senator at this time. Uh, he was known nationally um, for his rousing oratory. He was considered one of the best speakers at the time. Obviously, he had promoted national um, legislation. So everyone knew Stephen Douglas, whether they lived in Illinois or not. Running against Stephen Douglas in, from the new political party, the Republican Party, which is, yes, the modern-day Republican Party, was the little-known uh, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln had served minor political uh, offices prior to this. He'd served one term in the House of Representatives. But compared to Stephen Douglas, nobody knew who Abraham Lincoln was in 1858. And so Abraham Lincoln needed to make a name for himself. If he had any chance of defeating Stephen Douglas for the senatorial campaign, he needed to make a name for himself. And so he challenged Stephen Douglas to a series of seven debates across the state of Illinois uh, in order to prove that he was equally as smart as Stephen Douglas and maybe uh, as good of a speaker as well. These speeches are collectively known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates over who was going to be elected to the U.S. Senate. Now, at Freeport, Illinois, during one of these uh, campaign debates, Abraham Lincoln challenged Stephen Douglas. Remember, Stephen Douglas is the big guy behind popular sovereignty, but the Dred Scott decision has just recently happened. And so Abraham Lincoln says to, Dred or says to uh, Stephen Douglas, when it comes down to it, if a territory does not want slavery, who should win out? Should it still be based on popular sovereignty, or should we follow the Supreme Court decision in Dred Scott? Now, basically, Lincoln is trying to put Douglas between a rock and a hard place, because if he has to choose one over the other, he's going to alienate part of his constituency, part of the people who want to vote for him. So what Douglas said in response is called the Free Port Doctrine. And basically what he said was that if the people of a territory don't want slavery, they're not going to create legislation that is going to welcome pro-slavery people into their territory. People are naturally not going to move um, to a free soil state or a free soil territory because the legislation and the economic uh, focus there is not going to be advantageous for a slave owner. Now, he's kind of skirting around the issue, but this uh, still opens up a whole another can of worms within the, uh, the Senate. Here is Abraham Lincoln as a young uh, man. Now, in the end, Stephen Douglas was reelected to the U.S. Senate, uh, namely because at this time the Senate was still decided by, through an indirect election by the state legislature. It wasn't through a popular vote. Uh, so Stephen Douglas was reelected in 1858, but this is where Abraham Lincoln makes himself a national figure. People start to know him because he had gone up against uh, Stephen Douglas and had not, you know, been completely defeated. Um, also from the Lincoln-Douglas debates, even though Douglas did win his election to the U.S. Senate, he shot himself in the foot when it came time to run for president two years later because uh, his participation during those Lincoln-Douglas debates uh, is not going to be forgotten throughout the United States. And Southerners were not going to vote for Stephen Douglas because he had openly come out against the Lecompton Constitution and he had given that free poor doctrine, not unequivocally siding with slavery. So even though Douglas won in 1858, this is part of why he did not win the presidential election in 1860. And from here on out, the Democratic Party would be split between the North and the South. The only way the Democrats can win the presidential election in 1860 is to be truly a national party. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Here is Lincoln and Douglas during their debates in 1858. 